Uh, my name is Bishar Dumani. I'm a professor of history here at Brown University and also the Mahmoud Darwish Professor of Palestinian Studies. I welcome you to the first annual Mahmoud Darwish Lecture organized by New Directions in Palestinian Studies and DPS, a research, teaching, and outreach initiative within the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Um, this event is not being live streamed but it, it is being recorded, uh, so you should be aware of that. And uh, it might possibly go out on YouTube later. Um, <clears throat> and therefore, I will do something I never do in my introductions, which is actually to introduce the speakers, because I assume that you've all saw our posters with their biographies, but for the people who may watch this later, I will do that. Uh, but first, let me tell you a word about New Directions in Palestinian Studies. It supports engaged scholarship that centers Palestinians in knowledge production projects. It does it in a number of ways. Uh, we have at Brown here the first endowed postdoctoral fellowship in pa Palestinian studies uh, in the country, and the first chair in Palestine, endowed chair in Palestine. By, by endowed, I mean as long as Brown is around, there will be a chair in Palestinian studies. And that's a very important thing. It broke a lot of diamond, steel, and glass barriers in this country. Uh, we also do it through uh, a book series with the University of California Press. It's also the first such series that's devoted to Palestinian studies. And the seventh book in the series by Professor Nora Parr is titled Novel Palestine, Nation Through the Works of Ibrahim Rasrallah. It's actually about one of our speakers today. And all the books in the series are uh, open access, free download. Just type in New Direction of Palestinian Studies, University of California Press, and you can just go there and download the books. Uh, and I want to recognize here Alex Winder, who worked with me uh, on that series and is the Associate Director of Middle East Studies. Uh, thank you, Alex. And we also do it through an annual uh, workshop that brings together emerging and established scholars that take stock of research trends and uh, produce original works for publication, which we help them with, and encourage networking across academic and research institutions, and of course, outreach activities such as this lecture series. The theme of uh, the lecture today is, quote, every time they try to erase us, oh, so first of all, sorry, it's called, quote, Palestinian, dot, dot. Every time, every time they try to erase us, we become clearer. And I just want to say a tiny 45 seconds about the three parts of this title, Palestinian, erasure, and we become clearer. And I will do so, uh, I think, fitting enough, with a quote from Mahmoud Darwish, um, that is directly related to this idea uh, that uh, in an interview he had with a Lebanese poet and novelist and journalist Abbas Baidun in 1995, quote, Palestinian poetry has, for less than a decade, become conscious of the necessity of humanizing its themes and passing from Palestine as a topic or as an object to Palestinian as a subject. So I think the choice of the word Palestinian is not accidental here. And it's never been more important to name a people, to include them in the conversation, to center their experiences, to see the world through their eyes, to humanize them and hear their voices uh, than this moment that we're in now, a historic moment. I don't need to go through what's happening today and what's been happening the last year. It's been almost a year. Now, next week, it'll be a year, next Monday. Uh, <clears throat> since, uh, if we consider genocide as a form of erasure, uh, that's something that Palestinians and now in Lebanon are living through. Um, we just had a, a magical class uh, with our two guests, uh, my class and uh, understanding the Palestinians, uh, in which uh, uh, Ibrahim and Buddha talked about how if you cannot feel pain, if you cannot, if your pain does not allow you to share and feel the pain of others, it's not real pain. And so when I say um, 
words such as genocide, erasure, um, dehumanization, I mean everybody in this world who went through these experiences. We honor all of that. Uh, <clears throat> as far as we become clear, I would like to again quote Mahmoud Darwish in a different interview a year later. Quote, poetry cannot reconcile with power because it is obsessed with the duty of creating its own strength by establishing a vital space for the defense of righteousness, justice, and the victim. And it's a space that we are demanding on campuses and in this country everywhere. Quote, poetry is the unshakable ally of the victim, and it can only find the ground of understanding with history on the basis of this fundamentalist, fundamental principle. Uh, he says that in a different way, uh, in the same interview, he says, I always viewed poetry as a trace of absence. Again, the question of erasure and becoming clearer. Here's the format for today. Um, please, if you need to sit down, I think we're ready to go. Uh, we gotta start with a very short um, video of uh, uh, the Edward Said Orchestra in Amman in an original work based on one of the poems in the collection today, which was released today. Uh, of four poems by Rahid Lassula, translated uh, uh, by, by Huda Fakhreddin, uh, along with some other material. And one of the poems is uh, uh, Maryam Bazzi. And so this is an original work uh, on that poem in which there's music and reading and singing. We'll see a very small part of it. Then um, there'll be a poetry reading in English and in Arabic. Um, and then a series of questions uh, and, and a conversation really between Huda and Ibrahim. Uh, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, all of that will take about the first 50 minutes and then open discussion. Um, allow me an introduction. I hate doing it, but I think it's necessary. I'll make it as brief as possible. Uh, Ibrahim Nasrallah was born in Amman, Jordan, 1954, though in, in this book, he says he experienced the Nakba uh, of 1948. So you might want to ask him how that is possible. Uh, <clears throat> to Palestinian parents who were uprooted in 1948 from their homeland, he is the winner of many, many prizes. I will just mention the Katara Prize for Arabic novels, for the spirits of Kilimanjaro, uh, in which he ascended the mountain the Kalanjaro mountain, along with some disabled Palestinians, and told that story, uh, how that happened. Uh, and the Arabic Booker Prize for the Second War of the Dog. Um, he's published 14 poetry collections, 24 novels, 14 of which are part of the epic Palestinian tragic comedy series, and two books of film criticism. He's also a painter and a photographer. Um, uh, I had the real pleasure of visiting him in his workspace, and I was mesmerized by the paintings and the photographs. We have to do something at some point about that. Um, Huda Fakhreddin uh, uh, is a writer, a translator, and the author of several scholarly books on Arabic poetry, including the Arabic prose poem, Poetic Theory and Practice by Edinburgh University Press, and co-editor of the Routledge Handbook of Arabic Poetry. Her translations, which is the only thing I can think of that's more difficult than writing poetry is translating it, but that's, that's another subject, um, have appeared in the Arab Literature Quarterly, uh, Asymptote, Asymptot, Nimrod, and World Literature Today, among many others. She teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she does. Yes. Did I? Indeed she does. Oh, indeed. <laughs> Which, if any of you are following the campaign to silence Palestinian voices in this country, you have a special place to, in my, for some of the universities uh, in this country and the professors in silence in mind. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm so I know this is a very tough moment. 
uh, to have a Palestinian and a Lebanese at this particular moment in time uh, sitting with us. So I, I thank you for being with us at this time. Okay. Uh, yes, Mohanna, Director of Middle East Studies, Center for Middle East Studies, and obviously far more and the tech techie than, yeah. than, than myself.
يا أخت روحي وأخت صلاتي وأخت الضحى في الوضوح وأخت مامات العظيم هنا وما قد تبقى لنا من ممات وما قد تبقى لنا من حياة السلام على الأرض ليس لنا أهذه السماء التي فوقنا لا ترانا أمن الصليب على ظهرنا في حقول الدم المر يحجبنا السلام على الأرض ليس لنا السلام لأعدائنا يا إلهي وللطائرات وللموت يهبط للموت يصعد للموت يحكي ويكذب يرقص لا شيء يكفيه لا دمنا في الفجيعة أو دمنا في الجمال ولا دمنا في البحار ولا دمنا في السهول ولا دمنا في الجبال ولا دمنا في التراب ولا دمنا في الرمال ولا دمنا في الإجابة أو دمنا في السؤال ولا دمنا في الشمال ولا دمنا في الجنوب ولا دمنا في السلام ولا دمنا في الحول Thank you all for joining us. Can you hear me? I'll try to project. I have a lot of energy to project. This is day 360 of genocide. And since this is being recorded and history is a record, this is day 360 of genocide and expanding Israeli state terror. And there is nothing we could have done with our time better than listen to Palestinian children in the Edward Said Orchestra gathered from Ramallah, Jerusalem, Jordan, Algeria, singing a poem by Ibrahim Nasrallah. This poem is titled Maryam Gaza, Mary of Gaza. Peace on earth is not for us, not for my son, not for yours, Mary said to Mary. O oh, sister of my land, sister of my footsteps on this land, Sister of my soul, my prayers, sister of dawn in its clarity, sister of my death in its calamity, here in what remains for us of death and what remains of life. Peace on earth is not for us. Does the sky above not see us or do the crosses on our backs in the fields of bitter blood obscure us? Peace on earth is not for us. It is for our enemies, O oh God for their plains. It is for death as it descends and death as it ascends, for death as it speaks, lies and dances, nothing satisfies it. Neither our blood in sorrow, nor our blood in beauty, neither our blood in the seas, nor our blood in the fields, our blood in the mountains, our blood in the soil, our blood in the sands, our blood in the answer, our blood in the question, our blood in the north, our blood in the south, our blood in peace, our blood in war, nothing satisfies it. Peace on earth is not for us. Peace is for our enemies, O oh God, for their guards in distant lands in, and in those nearby. Peace is for every brother who, like an enemy, besieges us and every brother who passes over our death to build his throne on our ruins. There is no place here for a butterfly and a girl who lost her feet, no place for a lover to be killed by love, no place for plains, no place for the poem exalting its poet who writes, if I die, you must live to tell my story. If I die, you must live to tell my story. The sea is not for the bird or the beloved, and the sky has turned its back on us like a foreign land. Take everything, O oh God, 
and keep us here, close to our sea and the graves of our loved ones and our homes here. We will not disappear. We'll remain nearby. Take us or keep us if you wish, whenever or ho however you want. We'll stay close to your heart's eye or, O oh God, be our fortress. We will not escape our death if night falls. We will remain, O oh God, at the doors of your soul. The church, the mosque, the sea, the soil, the palm trees, and life or what little survives. Or, O oh God, take us, but keep a little of our souls here, some of our remains here on the thresholds of our houses and their ruins. Peace on this earth is not for us. O oh God, peace on this earth will be mine, mine, not yours. Since the children of my soul ascended the sky to you, peace has become the, the butterflies fluttering between their fingers. Nothing remains for me here but their remains. A long day that moans, ruined thresholds and names covered with feathers of fallen doves between their fingers, the butterflies' sunsets on the wounds of the horizon. I will not say peace is for those who kill, uproot, and burn. Peace on this earth was ours before them here, and peace on this earth will be ours after them. Peace is ours. Peace is ours. Good evening. Sahih uh, Kulu Shukur, Lakum Ala Hodorikum, Kulu Shukur Li Dairat, Aukusm Tijahat, Jadida Fidrasat of Palestinia, Wa Doctor Sadiq Al Aziz Daman, Pshara Domani, Kulu Shukur Li Sadiq Al Aziza. مؤلفة هذا الكتاب بالإنجليزية. Will you let me translate? Okay. Ibrahim would like to thank New Directions and Palestinian Studies for hosting us, and I join him in that. And our dear friend, Professor Pshara Dumani, and thank you all for coming. He is giving me more credit than I deserve, but it's an honor to be in your presence. و أنا سعيد هذا المساء بأن أكون الضيف الأول لكرسي محمود درويش. Very happy to be the first to give the inaugural Mahmoud Darwish lecture. هذه تعني لي الكثير لشاعر كبير نعتز به وشاعر متجدد وجدد الشعر العربي وأضاف إليه الكثير. This means a lot in memory of a great poet who challenged himself to the very end. and contributed a lot to Arabic poetry. فهذه مناسبة كبيرة. ثم شكر لكم جميعا على حضوركم. هذا الذي يعطي معنى حقيقيا لهذا اللقاء. This is a very significant occasion for all of us, and thank you very much for your presence, which really gives this meaning. سأقرأ القصيدة الثانية بناية building. Building. في الغرفة ستة وسبعون في الممر ستة وسبعون في الحمام والمطبخ ستة وسبعون في الجوع والمرض ستة وسبعون في رغيف الخبز الوحيد الذي تتأمله مئة واثنتان وخمسون عينا ستة وسبعون في جرعة الماء الأخيرة في غيمة الغبار التي عبرت النافذة وفي صوت القذيفة التي دمرت البيت المجاور وفي صوت سيارة الإسعاف التي لم تستطع الوصول إلى أي جرح ستة وسبعون في الهواء القليل 
وفي بكاء طفلة لا تدرك ما يدور وطفل لم يفهم الحرب إلا بعد أن تقطعت يداه ستة وسبعون في الليلة التالية للليلة المئة للقصف ستة وسبعون وفي السجل المدني في شهادات الميلاد ستة وسبعون في الظلال هنا ستة وسبعون وعلى الدرج يتراكضون حينما أغارت الطائرات ستة وسبعون لحظة صمت تبتلع الكون ولا شيء يبقى غير قبر بحجم العالم We could have read sitting down, but I think we're all very anxious and we're going to keep uh, pacing back and forth. This is a building and this poem and the poem we'll read next are not in the chapbook. These are two new poems, uh, which will be coming out soon in uh, two different journals. So this is a conversation that has kept me alive for a year of genocide. And it ends with a scene of a huge crater in the ground those of you who have uh, family in Lebanon know exactly how horrifying it is to imagine. To imagine. A building. 76 are in the room. In the hallway, in the bathroom, in the kitchen. 76. In hunger and illness. 76. In the loaf of bread on which 152 eyes are fixed. 76. In the last sip of water, in the cloud of dust that crossed the window, in the echoes of the bomb that leveled the house next door, in the sirens of the ambulance that couldn't reach the wound, 76. In the scarce air, in the girl's tears, she who doesn't know what's going on, and the boy's cry, he who only understood war after his hands were cut off, 76. In the night after the hundredth of this bombing, 76. In the civil record, in the birth certificates, 76. 76 are in the shadows and in the stairwell where they all gather when the raids begin. A moment of silence swallows the universe. Nothing remains except a grave as wide as this world. وأنا رأيت الموت ليس هناك فلسطيني ربما لم يقل وهو يتحدث مع الآخرين عن تجاربه للحفاظ على حياته أو حياة سواه لقد رأيت الموت وأنا رأيت الموت أنا رأيت وجهه يديه شعره الطويلة حاجبيه صمته أنا سمعت ضحكته غافلته فتشت في جيوبه عن كل من فقدتهم فلم أجد فيها سوى اسمي صورتي وامرأة أحببتها في حلمي رأيته في كل شيء ها هنا في شارعي وزهرة الصبير والإناء فيما تقول الأرض للركام من كلام وما تقول للأطفال والذئاب هذه السماء I'm oversharing that's that's okay. I'm very lucky to have been 
and will always be Ibrahim Nasrallah's translator. He only read the opening of the poem and wants me to read the entire poem. He is very gracious and he said, I am partner in writing this text. This is a collaboration and a friendship that is as gracious and as wide as the universe. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. You could have read the whole thing, Ibrahim. We would have loved that, but I saw death. Ibrahim notes in the beginning of this poem that every Palestinian speaking of his or her experience and survival must have at some point said, I have seen death. And I saw death. I saw his face, his hands, his long hair, his eyebrows, his silence. I saw his silence. I heard him laugh. I walked by his side. I searched his pockets for all those I have lost but I only found my name, my face, and a woman I once loved in a dream. I saw death in everything, in my street, in the cactus blossom, in the vase, in the words the earth says to the rubble, and the words the sky says to children and wolves. I saw de death in everything, in the roads to peace, the roads to war, the roads to graves, and the roads to air. I saw death in a tank on the pavement just two days ago, in airplanes, in soldiers, in ruins. I saw him in the sip of water I've been craving since before the clouds, the sky made clouds. I saw him in the sip of water I've been craving since before the sky made clouds. I saw death standing in my door, and I am one without house or doors. Without doves or crows, I saw death, my grandfather told me, a hundred years or perhaps a thousand deaths ago. I too saw death, my grandmother said, and so did my daughter in this silence now. I saw him too, my aunt said, and so did my uncle, neighbors, my siblings, all, and the woman I once loved in a dream. I saw death, my palm tree said, and who doesn't believe a palm tree? or a wave or a breeze broken on our last wall. What, what a rose speaks into a sea of blood. Who can deny what the heart says under the rubble? What the day emptied of day says. Who can deny, who can deny what they say, they, they who go to sleep never to return. I saw death in the sea to the north and the south of fear, in my smile, in my tear, in what I write and what I say, in the corners where I, where I was and wasn't, and out in the open where a rocket hovers and my soul is but the echo. I saw death in the barking of a dog, in the song of a lonely bird in a cage, in the saddest of things, in the sweetest of stories. I saw death in the wind, the sand, the bed, the grave, the music, the lament, the prayer, the despair, the hope, and every time I wanted to cry out, Enough. Yet, during the only truce, I noticed that he wasn't there. I didn't see him in the bareness of my body and mind. But as soon as I walked toward those of us who had survived, I saw him lurking in my shadow. فلسطيني صمت ولم يجد هذا تكلمت لم يجد هذا شتمت اعتذرت ولم يجد هذا انشغلت تشاغلت لم يجد هذا جلست مشيت ركضت تجفت تدفأت لم يجد هذا عطشت إلى أن تشققت ثم شربت إلى أن غرقت تفتت مثل جنين ومثل أبيه وإخوته أمه وتجمعت في كفن من بقايا الستائر لم يجد هذا
Palestinian. I was silent, nothing came of it. I spoke and nothing came of it. I cursed, I apologized and nothing came of it. I was busy, I pretended to be busy and nothing. I sat, I walked, I ran, I shivered, I warmed up, nothing. I was parched until I cracked, I drank until I drowned, I crumbled like a fetus, like the father, the siblings and the mother. I was then gathered in a shroud made of old curtains and nothing came of it. I stumbled more than I could stand, but then I stood up and nothing came of it. I prayed until, like a prophet, I became a verse in a holy book. I rode until I reached hell. I besieged and begged and nothing. I raged, I calmed, I remembered what was once distant, and I forgot what was always close. I befriended a monster, I fought a monster, I died young, and sometimes I survived. Both times I grew old from all that I had seen, and nothing came of it. I charged, I withdrew, I fought the wind when it blew, and I reconciled with the waves when I rose and raged. Among the, among the horses, my heart was a, was a horse, and in the night, my grief was a night, and nothing came of it. I am all these elements, O God, fire, earth, wind, and water. The fifth is a pain that blind songs can't see, and their sixth is this immense loneliness, and their seventh, since my slaughter, is blood. When I burned, I inhabited the letters of my free name like a butterfly, Palestine. When my roof was suddenly blown off into the sky and with it a wall, a window, and my youngest, I gathered myself in the G and the A and the Z and the A. I became Gaza. A thousand warplanes circled and struck me. I collapsed and collapsed again and then rose with a scream. I called out, but nothing came of it. I lost faith and believed and lost faith and believed again and lost faith and believed and nothing, nothing came of it. And the despicable world asks me, all this, what for and what of it? Shukran, Ibrahim. Thank you. Shukran. And now we be now for something completely different. No, <laughs> not different at all. Okay. So as I said, uh, Ibrahim and I have been in conversation. I've been interrogating him for almost a year, and the interrogation will continue. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm trying to collect myself in the G and the A and the Z and the A. My first question uh, to you, Ibrahim, is uh, this is the Mahmoud Darwish inaugural lecture. Uh, I wrote them down, so maybe I can help myself and read. How often does Mahmoud Darwish cross your mind these days? And he is the most present and the most absent. I find myself going back to many pieces and poems by him, and I'm amazed at how accurately he's speaking about this moment. How often does Mahmoud Darwish cross your mind? And is the Palestinian writer and poet destined to live their Nakba, remember their Nakba, and continue to predict Nakbas to come? Ya yeah, Ibrahim. كم يخطر ببالك محمود درويش هذه الأيام وهو الأكثر حضورا والأكثر غيابا وأنا أذهل دائما حين أستعيد بعض كتاباته وقصائده من دقة وصفها لهذه اللحظة فسؤالي الأول لك كم يخطر ببالك هذا الحاضر الغائب وهل كتب على الشعر الفلسطيني أن يتذكر النكبة ويعيش النكبة ويتنبأ بنكبات قادمة <تصفيق> شكرا الحقيقة يعني حينما نتأمل محمود درويش وحضور محمود درويش أنا بعتقد لا الكبار لا يموتون Great men don't die <laughs> and when we think of محمود درويش we 
Remember that great men don't, and women. And great women. Great <laughs> human beings yes. don't die. Yeah. ومحمود درويش واحد من الشعراء الفلسطينيين الذين نستحضرهم بقوة هذه الأيام في الحرب على غزة والآن الحرب على لبنان. And he is one of many poets we who come to mind uh, as we experience and witness the war on Gaza and now in Lebanon. وليس مصادف أن يحضر محمود درويش لأنه محمود درويش ساهم في تكوين الهوية الفلسطينية كما ساهم في تطور الشعر العربي. And it's not a coincidence Mahmoud Darwish is central and formative to the to Palestinian identity and to modern Arabic poetry. ولعل من أسرار محمود درويش المعلنة أنه عاش الوطن في فلسطين عام ما ما تبقى من فلسطينيين عام 1948 ثم عاش المنفى أيضا حينما خرج and one of the well-known secrets of Mahmoud Darwish's experience is that he lived in what was left of Palestine after 1948 and he also lived the experience of exile. بالتأكيد هو واحد ممن شكلوا أدب المقاومة في فلسطين. And he is one of the founders of the resistance literature in Palestine. ثم حينما كان خارج فلسطين هو واحد ممن شكلوا أدب العودة إلى فلسطين. And after he left Palestine in exile, he is one of the key figures in the literature of return. قوة قصائد محمود درويش هي ذلك السر المعلن أيضا الأكبر الذي يجعله حاضرا في كل تفاصيلنا التي نعيشها اليوم. And this well-known secret is the 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 reason of the power and the magic of Mahmoud Darwish's work that uh, remains alive in us. وليست مصادفة أن يعيش محمود درويش اليوم بيننا اليوم لأن هذه المسألة تتعلق بعدد مهم من الأدباء الفلسطينيين الذين يعيشون بيننا اليوم رغم أنهم رحلوا. So he, like many of the other, other, many other Palestinian writers and poets who have passed away, they remain alive in us as we experience what we're experiencing. يحضر بقوة شديدة غسان كنفاني الذي تم اغتياله من قبل الإسرائيليين في السبعينيات في بدايات السبعينيات. Another giant presence is غسان كنفاني who was assassinated in Beirut in the early 70s. ويحضر ناجي العلي الذي تم اغتياله ايضا في لندن من قبل المخابرات الاسرائيليه. And another powerful presence is Naji Ali who was assassinated by the Mossad in London. ويحضر عبد الرحيم محمود الذي قتل ايضا على يد الاسرائيليين عام 1948. عبد الرحيم محمود عبد الرحيم محمود هو سيد ما هي جملة سأحمل روحي على راحتي وألقي بها في سأحمل روحي على راحتي وألقي بها في مهب الردى فإما حياة تسر الصديقة وإما ممات يغيز العدى How do you say that? And I know Yes, this is a very famous line Life that pleases a friend or death that spites the enemy so many, many great Palestinian names who remain alive in us today. وربما هذا هو الدرس الأكبر أنك أيضا لا تستطيع مهما ملك امتلكت من قوة أن تقتل فنانا وكاتبا كبيرا. Great artists and poets and writers do not die. You cannot kill them. بقدر ما نكون معتزين بأن قصيدة كتبت قبل 30 أو 40 سنة أو 50 سنة تتحدث عن اليوم بقدر ما نكون حزينين في نفس الوقت أن هذا الوضع لم يتغير نعم and as proud as we are that a poem written 30 years ago can speak of this moment it's also tragic and very sad أننا نظل نظل عالقين في هذه اللحظة هذا مصير الفلسطيني the, the sad part is that time seems to have stopped for the Palestinian. They keep living and reliving their Nakba. وبقدر ما نكتب أحيانا عن شخص أو إنسان أو طفلة أو امرأة قتلت قبل عشرين سنة أو ثلاثين سنة 
نكتشف أنها تعيش اليوم ما زالت على قيد الحياة ومعنى أن الشعب الفلسطيني لا يستطيع أن يموت When we remember or think or read a poem about the death of a person, a woman or a child 30 years ago, we also remember that they are alive in the poem. Another reminder and proof that the Palestinian people will never, never die. When I said in my story of Palestine that my story is always different from my story, it may be possible to explain this situation that we live in. And this is reflected in lines in many poems, actually, where Ibrahim says that uh, we weep and we smile or we laugh and we cry at the same time. And <laughs> So we are very proud of these authors and writers and artists who have contributed, who have helped build our identity and our souls and offered us so much beauty that is still ahead of us, not behind us. رغم أنهم ماتوا أو قتلوا بعيدا عن هنا. And we conjure up their presence. We remember them. They are present among us as we sit here, many, many thousands of miles away from Palestine. But they are present with us. لأنهم ببساطة جزء من أصبح جزء من جمال العالم. They have offered us so much beauty and have become part of the beauty of this world. كنت أحب يا إبراهيم أن تخبرنا شيئا شخصيا عن محمود ولكن ليس ضروريا هنا الجمهور يطلب I'm asking for some some personal memory or experience with محمود that comes back to you these days يعني أولا أنا عرفت محمود حينما جاء إلى عمان قبل ذلك لم نلتقي في أي سنة؟ في بداية التسعينيات. So Ibrahim first met Mahmoud when he came to Amman in the early nineties. وكانت تجربة لقائه تجربة جميلة وتركت هذا الأثر الرائع عن شاعر كبير وإنسان كبير. He it was a beautiful meeting and experience, and it left a beautiful echo in me meeting this great writer and great human being. And always, probably, the most important thing for Mahmoud is that research is always about developing his poetic experience. No. And one of the distinguishing beautiful features about Mahmoud Darwish and his uh, poetic career is his challenging of himself and his experimentation in his uh, poetry. And this makes him a great role model because he's a an author who refuses to be complete. He refuses for the, his experience or his career to be complete. It's always becoming. فقد كان يدرك أن الاكتمال هو النهاية. Because he knew that to be complete is to end. وهذا ربما أجمل ما في محمود درويش وفي مشروع محمود درويش. And that's probably the most beautiful thing in him as a person and his uh, poetic project. Moving on, من محمود درويش. Uh, بدأنا اللقاء اليوم يا إبراهيم بفيديو من uh, تعاونك مع أوركسترا مح... uh, أدوارد سعيد. أدوارد سعيد. شفت محمود درويش حاضر زيادة عن <تصفيق> من أوركسترا أدوارد سعيد. أخبرنا أكثر عن هذه التجربة وخاصة عن العمل مع الشباب والشابات في الأوركسترا. 
إذا أحببت بعد التفاصيل عن أهمية هذا العمل. So I'm asking uh, Ibrahim to tell us a little bit more about this collaboration with the Edward Said Orchestra and the experience of working with young Palestinian, uh, with youth, Palestinian youth. أولا أحب أن أقول إنه بالبداية أنا كان طموحي أن أدرس الموسيقى. نعم. We all know if you've read uh, um, Ibrahim's autobiography that one of his aspirations was to become a musician. وحتى أنني كتبت ديوان إنه لو أنني كنت ماسترو. And he has a poetry collection titled "If Only I Were a Maestro." أما بقية الجملة داخل القصيدة فتقول لو أنني كنت ماسترو لكانت حياتي أفضل. My, so the rest of that statement, my life would have been better. If only I'd been a maestro. يعني حتى أنني لم أنجح في الثانوية العامة في المدرسة إلا مقابل وعد يعني قطعوا أهلي على أنهم إذا نجحت سنرسلك لدراسة الموسيقى. And I only studied and passed exams, uh, graduated from high school because my parents uh, promised me to send me, promised to send me to music school. لكن ببساطة حينما نجحت جاءت أمي وقالت ذهبت إلى حوش بيتنا وملأت حجرها ثوبها ثنت وهيك بأوراق العنب الساقطة بالخريف وجاءت لي ووضعت أمامي نثرت أمامي وقالت هذا كل ما نملك من مال <laughs> but when he passed, his mother uh, went out into the yard and gathered all the fallen uh, grapevine leaves in her dress and told him, this is all the money we have. Uh, but this is probably a good thing. I don't know, because I'm not music. It's probably a good thing that I'm going to be this book. We all think it's a good thing. It turned out well. <laughs> yes. ربما لكن ربما عوضت أيضا عن عدم الذهاب إلى الموسيقى بأنني كتبت كثير من الأغاني لفرق في الأردن وفلسطين وأحيانا غنيت بعد الأغاني في تونس والآن لدينا تجربة رائعة مع مغنية تونسية هي غالية بن علي. But I compensated for not becoming a maestro by writing lyrics for many songs across the Arab world and in Tunis and Palestine. And there's a recent collaboration with Ghali uh, Ali, uh, Ben Ali, the Tunisian musician. ودائما كنت أحب أن يعني قرأت شعري مع موسيقيين خاصة بالسنوات الخمسة أو الست الماضية. And I've always collaborated with musicians and performing my poetry in the past few years. بحيث تشبه القراءة الأمسية الشعرية تماما ما ورد هنا حينما قرأت وهناك موسيقى معي وموسيقية. So often poetry readings are accompanied by music as similar to what we saw in the video. لكن بالصدفة يعني حينما قالوا لي ماذا بعد الأمسية التالية قلت لهم سأقرأ مع أوركسترا مع أنني لم أكن أعرف أنني سأقرأ مع أوركسترا. ثاني يو أولي كنت دائما تحب أن تقرأ. صحيح. Yeah. Uh, he always looked forward or Imad dreamed of, of reading with an orchestra and the dream came to the Edward Said uh, Orchestra. كانت هاي القصيدة مريم غزة هي تحدي لي أصلا حينما كتبتها وكانت تحدي كبير لسهيل خوري حينما لحنها. So this was a big challenge for me, but also for Suhail Khouri, who was the composer. Because it was his first experience uh, composing music for a, a work this big. So the strategy was jump in the sea and see how far you can swim. وكان من الرائع حينما أرسل لي الموسيقى أولا بعيدا عن الأصوات الغنائية ومدتها 23 دقيقة حقيقة يعني دهشت أنني أمام عمل سيمفوني كبير وجديد تماما في المجال الغناء الموسيقي الفلسطيني And I was Amazed when they sent me 23 minutes of this work. It was a new and fresh and unique symphonic work. 
وسعيد ايضا انه هذا العمل حينما قدم في حفلتين في عمان دعما لغزه انه لقي ذلك الحضور والاستقبال الحقيقي الاستثنائي ايضا. And it was a very unique and significant uh, it was very well the two performances in Amman of this work were very well received and uh, they were in support of Gaza. كل ما اتمنى ان نلقي انا وسهيل نفسنا في البحر مره اخرى واخرى so you لنكتشف ما الذي يمكن ان نفعله. Looking forward to more adventures with Suhail. Hopefully no drowning, more swimming. سؤالي الآخر سأبقى مع الشباب والأطفال ونحن نشاهد يا إبراهيم توحشهم في غزة ونشاهد مشاهد قتل الأطفال واستباحة الجسد الفلسطيني يخطر ببالي إبراهيم الطفل من طفولة حتى الآن كيف يشاهد الطفل فيك هذه المشاهد المريعة؟ وأنت في قصيدة في هذا الكتاب تتكلم بلسان الأطفال وتسأل مئة سؤال يطرحها طفل في غزة علينا. So, ماذا فعلت بك هذه التجربة أن تشهد على إبادة جماعية لمدة سنة كاملة؟ ماذا فعلت بالطفل فيك ذلك الذي نشأ في المخيم؟ So my question to Ibrahim is the, when, I, when we watch the horrifying Uh, images streamed live to us on our screens of the desecration of uh, the Palestinian body, the slaughter of Palestinian children, ongoing, non-stop. I remember uh, the character who is also Ibrahim, the child in his autobiography, and I'm wondering how the child in him, the child who grew up in the refugee camp, receives these images. <laughs> كانت فحوى أن الإبادة لم تتوقف في أي يوم من الأيام. مؤخرا هذا المقال آه في القدس العربي. آه. I wrote an article not long ago in القدس العربي and I said that the genocide never stopped. لقد عشنا إبادات إبادة مستمرة ولكن على مراحل. We have been living an ongoing genocide in phases. يعني حينما يقتل في هذا العام 100 وفي هذا العام 100 وفي هذا العام 100 لا يعتبرون كل 100 اباده لكن عمليا هي اباده لانه اذا جمعت حصيله هذه الابادات فهي الاباده الاباده. So when a hundred die one year and a hundred die another year if we gather all the, the immense loss of Palestinian lives over the past hundred years It is one long genocide. وأنا يعني ما يحيرني إنه لماذا يجب أن يقتل خمسين ألف حتى نقول هذه إبادة. And I am horrified and I wonder why does it take uh, why do we need 50,000 people to die so that we call it genocide. وقتل طفل واحد هي إبادة. The death of one child is genocide. ويكفي أن نقول إبادة. And we should and is enough that we call One death is enough that we call it a genocide. قتل كل هؤلاء الأباء والأمهات وترك عشرات الآلاف من الأيتام هذه إبادة مستمرة يعني ستتوقف الإبادة يوما ما ولكن هذه الإبادة ستستمر ما داموا هؤلاء على قيد الحياة وأبنائهم على قيد الحياة وأحفادهم على قيد الحياة. It is an ongoing genocide because the, the hundreds of thousands dying now and the hundreds of thousands of orphans left behind, in them a genocide will continue to happen. ولذلك من يقول أن الحرب تنتهي حينما يتوقف إطلاق النار هو لا يعرف شيئاً عن هذا العالم. A ceasefire does not end suffering in war. الصور المعلقة للذين للضحايا في البيوت هي استمرار حزين ومتكرر لهذه المقطع. The photographs of martyrs in every Palestinian Lebanese home is an on a continuation of war and genocide. وسواء تذكر هذا الطفل أباه أو أمه أو لم يستطع أن يتذكر أباه وأمه فهذه إبادة. It's a tragedy and a genocide whether the orphan child remembers their Uh, the parents they've lost, or if they don't remember them, it's 
in both cases a tragedy and a genocide. <laughs> شعراء وفنانين وروائيين وموسيقيين و... ومهندسين وأطباء وجزء من جمال العالم الذي سأفتقد ما دمت على قيد الحياة وسيفتقد كل ما سيولد فيما بعد I cannot but mourn the universes and lives lost when I think about, when I see the, the death of all the children in Gaza and now in Lebanon. And I wonder how many among them were going to grow up to be poets and painters and dancers and musicians and architects. And as long as I live, I will continue to mourn this immense loss. <laughs> تستمر النكبة في داخلي وفي كتابتي وفي مصيري أيضا وفي كل الميتات التي كان يمكن أن أموتها يعني فهي استمرار حقيقي لنكبة مر عليها كل هذا الزمن من عام 1948 وهذه إجابة عن سؤال بشارة قلت عشت النكبة مع أنك ولدت بعدها بسنوات إبراهيم يقول أتذكر تجارب أهلي آه سي ماي وايرز ار اول كروست عم ترجمك وأعيد ترجمة أنا أستحق الترجمة ما كنت واضح لا لا And this is a response to um, Bishara's early question when he said, ask him how he experienced the, the Nakba, although he was born sev- six, seven years after. Ibrahim is saying, I think uh, of my parents' experience, and they, are, they experienced the Nakba firsthand, and their sufferings uh, live in me and determine who I am, uh, my opportunities, the many deaths I could have died, the many lives. And it's a... Yeah. <laughs> العمر كله لكن يرعبني تماما أن طفلا يولد الآن سيعيش السبعين سنة المقبلة نكبة رسل I am 70 years old today but I am horrified, terrified by the idea that a child born today will live 70 years ahead the نكبة of غزة I am mindful of time We need to open it up. But let me ask one last question, and Ibrahim will give us a short answer. This book, Ibrahim, you wrote, you wrote these four books and you are looking at the worship. Is this book possible in the time of the worship? And is the book possible in the time of the worship? Is the book possible in the time of the worship? Is the book possible in the time of the worship? My question is, these four poems and the two we read were written during an ongoing genocide. Is poetry the form that can contain the horrors of a moment like this? Is writing at all possible anyway? And is poetry the, the only form capable of containing it? When you write about a عشت هذا الحدث فانك تتالم كثيرا في لحظه الكتابه when you write about a tragic event even if you haven't experienced it first hand you feel the pain you suffer اما حينما تكتب عن حدث كبير تشاهده بام عينيك فانك تتعذب ثلاث مرات whereas when you write about a horrifying event Uh, first hand, after having experienced it, you suffer three times. Once for experiencing it. Once when you write about it. And once. And then every time you read what you've written. And you will continue to live. الكتابة ممكن ربما بالشعر وكنت أتحدث اليوم نتحدث اليوم صباحا وقلت إنه 
في حدث كبير مثل هذا في إبادة كبيرة مثل هذا هذه لا تستطيع أن تؤجل مشاعرك المشاعر لا تؤجل عليك أن تعيشها وتعيش لحظتها والشعر لحسن الحظ وهو ابن القلب والروح قادر أن يعبر عن ذلك You cannot postpone your feelings when you experience an event as tra- colossal and tragic as this. And poetry, luckily, is the, is the product of feelings and uh, it passes through the heart. And so perhaps, maybe, that's why poetry is possible. Yes, but the bottom line is the worst thing possible is silence because once the poets are silent, the world loses. Let's open it up to your questions now. Are we doing good on time, Pedro? Yeah, I, th- I think we're good. Uh, I just want to say that we just spent two hours with a class talking about poetry and we covered an incredibly complementary terrain for this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have some students in that class who ask wonderful questions, and we'd like to hear from all the rest of you because there's so much to talk about. Do you want me to moderate, or, or do you, will you call on people? I can, I'd love to call on <laughs> Where are the people? Someone needs to break. I resist going first because I always but, have a question. But there you go. Um, Okay, I will say it in Arabic and then... Okay, my name is Ahmed, Usma Ahmed. Uh, Saeed Jiddan, Bhudurak, Bhudurak. I will speak in Arabic and then I can translate, or if you want to translate, of course. Uh, I have a very simple question in a sentence that I read a lot of my life, which I've read for a long time, maybe 10 years ago, which I've written in it, which I've written in it, هذه بلاد بحجم القلب يا حاج لا شيء فيها بعيد ولا شيء فيها غريب واليوم حكيت إنه الفلسطينيون لا يستطيعون الموت فكأنه بمخي أنا لا شعور أضفت ولا شيء فيها يموت هذه البلاد فلو ممكن توضح أكثر عن قضية عدم الاستطاعة أو عدم القدرة على الموت هل القصد تاعك إنه إحنا لا نمنح موت أو إحنا علينا واجب أن لا نموت أو الشروط تحتم علينا أن لا نموت لو ممكن توضح أكثر هاي الإشكالية ترجمة Okay, I just said um, translating myself, it's hard But anyways, I, um, there's a book called uh, The Time of White Horses uh, which Bahim Nasrallah wrote and I read like many many years ago but there's a sentence that stuck with me since then um, um, a character is addressing another and saying um, this homeland is the size of a heart Nothing in it is strange, and nothing in it, uh, nothing in it is far, and nothing in it is strange or foreign. And earlier, um, he said that um, Palestinians, and that's the tricky part. La yastatiruna means they cannot, or they shouldn't, or they can't die. And then in my head, I just added, in that um, homeland, nothing dies basically. So I'm just asking to uh, perhaps talk more about. This issue of death, if it's the condition not allowing us to die, or if there's a duty on us as Palestinians not to die, um, and you know that's basically what I asked. Shukran. Thank you. Shukran. Uh, was a question was a question. I think يعني تجيب يجيب عليه الواقع بطريقة بليغة دائما. It's an important question, it's a simple question, and I think the reality answers it very eloquently. The Palestinian people have been resisting and defending their land for over a hundred years. And the assault on the Palestinian people is, was never as great as, as it is today. But this 
And the enemies of this people expected it to be exterminated. But 10 years after 1948, a literature of resistance was born. وكان مكون أساسي للهوية الفلسطينية حتى أنني أقول دائما أنه كان الكتاب المقدس الثالث بالنسبة للفلسطينيين إلى جانب القرآن والإنجيل والتوراة والتوراة فورث فورث and uh, uh, this uh, <laughs> literature of resistance <laughs> became a formative element in Palestinian identity, a fourth holy book after the three holy books. لكن كل مرة كان يتجدد هذا الشعب كلما قالوا انتهى كلما كانت يعني 67 جاءت لتقضي على أو لاحتلال فلسطين كلها لكن فيما بعد ظهرت المقاومة الفلسطينية. So this is a people that is reborn every time it seems to be killed and 67 was supposed to end the Palestinian people but they came back بعد ذلك in resistance. جاء أيلول وجاءت الزعتر وجاءت صبرة وشتيلة ثم فجأة جاءت الانتفاضة حينما كان الناس يعتقدون أن الشعب الفلسطيني انتهى. Every time people think uh, the Palestinian people are done for, they rise up in an intifada. And, and Brian just listed many of the defeats and catastrophes and massacres that we feel like we're living today. We have lived a Nakba, a Naksa, Sabra, Shatila, Tal Zatar this past year. And the fathers reach a moment, uh, the parents, the mothers and fathers reach a moment and the children take over. And the grandchildren. And every time the rebellion and revolution against this fascism is stronger than the one that precedes it. وَلِذَلِكْ تَعَلَّمْنَا أَلَّا نَمُوتُ So we learned, Ya Ahmed, not to die. وَلَا نَسْتَطِيعَ نَمُوتُ We cannot die. It's still ambiguous, but we cannot die. اليوم وكل وفعلا اليوم ونحن نقول كل أنظمة العالم تهاجم غزة. The world regimes are attacking غزة, assaulting غزة. وتهاجم لبنان أيضا. And Lebanon. لم تتعلم الدرس أن هذه الشعوب لا تستطيع أن تموت. They have not learned that these people will never die. يعني في فترة من الفترات حينما كان يقول محمود درويش يا وحدنا يقول البعض إنه يعني هناك مبالغة بيا وحدنا بهذا القول. When Mahmoud Darwish in 1982, he said, Ya wahdana. How do you translate that? Oh, how alone we are. I decided to translate it. شو صار؟ كان البعض يعني يعتقد أن الفلسطيني يبالغ. Ah, it was thought of as an exaggeration. اسمح لي أضيف هون. Mahmoud Darwish لما قال ب 82, Ya wahdana. Mahmoud Darwish coined this phrase, which is grammatically very strange, even in Arabic. نحوي أنه شو Ya wahdana. It was thought of as an exaggeration. Hiba Abu Nada, who was murdered in an Israeli strike on October 20, writes a poem and speaks to Darwish and begins, Ya Wahdana. Mm -hmm. So definitely not an exaggeration anymore. Yeah. Not even For people who don't know, I mean, 1982 is the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. It's a huge event for people who don't know. And then the massacres of Sabra Shatila. It's the massacres of Sabra Shatila that followed. <laughs> But also the poet, the woman poet, is from Gaza. Heba Abu Nida in Ghan. Heba is from Gaza, and she an answered that strange grammatical creation by Mahmoud Darwish by beginning her own poem, Ya Wahdana, and gave her reading of it. So I just wanted to, yes. for people who don't, yeah. To Brahim's point, he's saying every time we think that the Palestinian people cannot do more, they cannot die more or be born again, uh, again, revived, rise from their ashes, something happened and they exceed all our, our expectations and theirs. So Hiba Abu Nada captures this in her conversation with Darwish and Diya Wahdan. ولذلك يعني حينما ربما للمرة الأولى في تاريخ العالم تكون كل الأنظمة ضد هذا الشعب. And this is probably the first time in the history of 
the universe that all of the regimes of the world are against لا لم يحدث هذا اذا مهما استعرضنا تاريخ العالم دائما كل قوى قوى شريره كان هناك من يقف جبهه واسعه تقف ضدها لكن الان لا احد يقف ضد ها كل هذا هذا الشكل من اشكال الاباده والموت الذي يتعرض له الشعب الفلسطيني الان وقد انتقلوا وليس في غزه وفي الضفه الغربيه والان في لبنان throughout history uh, oppressive brutal evil has always been uh, opposed by some entity never before the world stands silent and complicit in this brutal uh, assault on the palestinians Other questions? I'm going to talk in Arabic. I have a question to you, Mr. Stas. What do you think? If we look at the past, we see the impact of the past. زي ما مثلا غنى فيروز بال 67 الان الان وليس غدا كيف كان الفن يحرك الناس؟ هل تغير شيء في الحاضر؟ هل الفن لسه بيقدر يحرك الناس زي ما كان يحركنا قبل؟ هل ذنب جيلنا احنا؟ كيف هذا بياثر على قضيتنا؟ Do you want to translate? لا انت What's your name? فارس فارس عم يسال ها بالعربي حتى فارس is asking if um, what is the role of art? In short, right? And you refer to a song by Fayrouz in 1967, Now, today and not tomorrow, she is singing for the return of Palestinians to their homeland. Faris is asking, what is the role of art today in the face of this horrible genocide? And what is our responsibility? You're asking about the responsibility of your generation. أنا لا أشك أبدا بقوة الفن وقوة الأدب. I do not doubt for a minute the power of literature and art. لأنه إبراهيم الذي يجلس أمامكم هو محصلة كل الأداب التي قرأها والأفلام التي شاهدها واللوحات والموسيقى ولم ولو لم يكن كل هذا الإبداع في داخلي لما كان بإمكاني أن أجلس أمامكم. If it weren't for art and creativity, I wouldn't be who I am. I am the product of all the literature, the music, the art that I've been exposed to, read and listened to and seen. فأضرب المثال بنفسي لأنه أعتقد إنه أي إنسان يمكن يفتح قلبه للفن ويفتح قلبه للأدب ويفتح قلبه للسينما بشكل عام هو إنسان يتسع. بمعنى أنه يستطيع أن يرى ليس نفسه فقط ولكن أن يرى كل ما حوله وليس كل ما حوله ولكن أن يرى كل ما في العالم And I use myself an example I think a, p- a person who opens their heart and is open to art is capable of seeing himself their self clearer in the world around them ربما لأنه لدي تجارب في الأغا... كتابة الأغاني وكتابة القصائد وكتابة الروايات أحس ربما أفضل ما يمكن أن يمنح لي هو تلك الأراء البسيطة التي تأتيني من القراء And as a writer of poetry, novels, and lyrics, I think the best gift that I, could, I receive, best gifts are opinions and uh, comments from readers حينما يكتب إليك أسير فلسطيني في السجون الإسرائيلية أنني طوال قراءتي لزمن الخيول البيضاء كنت أحس أنني خارج السجن فأنت ساهمت في حريته. For example, prisoners in Israeli prisons write to Ibrahim and they say, when I read your book, The Time of White Horses, I felt that I was free. حينما تغني أمي أمي أنا عائشة في عرس احد اخوتي اغنيه لي دون ان تعرف انني انا الذي كتبتها هذا شيء كبير Another example is Ibrahim's mother singing a song in uh, whose wedding? 
واحد من اخوتي a family wedding not آه. knowing that he's آه. the author of the lyrics it's just a, it's just a song آه. هذا هو الجمال الادب وهذا روعه الادب وهي قدره الادب والفنون على ان تصلنا حتى احيانا دون ان نعرف من الذي كتب او من الذي الف هذه المقطوعه الموسيقيه وانا بعتقد انه من لا يقرا الادب وليست له علاقه بالفنون كمن يعيش ووجهه الى الحائط لن يرى من العالم اي شيء وكل كتاب جديد هو حياه جديده every new, every new book or work of art we're exposed to is a new life living without art or literature is like living with your face to the wall and this is how art changes the world and moves us and rebuilds us لا تستطيع ان تقول لاحد افعل كذا ف ربما لان هي شكل من اشكال الوصايا وليس هناك احد يعني يخترق الوصايا ويتجاوزها مع انه وضعها مثل الانسان yeah we all hate advice so <تصفيق> advice or commandments uh, don't work you know that Ferris and uh, people tend to not respond well so i guess the idea is that art is probably the best way to teach and advise and guide للأسف يعني هناك كل الكتب السماوية وكل الفلاسفة وكل الأدباء وكل الفنانين وكل وكل هذه المكتبات العظيمة لكن ما زلنا نشهد إبادة كما تحدث اليوم في غزة وهذا الصمت المرعب في العالم لولا هؤلاء الأحرار من الطلاب ومن الكتاب ومن الفنانين الذين يقفون ويقولون لا. So proof that didacticism preaching doesn't work is that we can I'm taking licenses here. Pile up all the holy books and all the philosophy and all the commandments, all the constitutions and light them up if something like Gaza is allowed to happen. So the only thing that can stand in the face of something like that is the brave voices, the poets, the singers, the musicians, the writers who say no. وهذا هو الدليل الوحيد أننا لم نزل نعيش في عالم الإنسان وليس عالم المفترسات. And art is the only proof that we are still human beings living in a human world and not in a world of monsters. Other questions? Yes, please. Hi, thank you. This has been so beautiful. Um, and just here. Um, I'm really struck by this Palestinian poem and the I, this repetition of, I did this and nothing came of it. I did this and nothing came of it. I did this and nothing came of it. And I'm wondering what type of, you know, you say people hate advice, but what type of <laughs> guidance words um, might you have for folks who are like continuing to feel this pull, continuing to do things and also struggling to feel like nothing's coming of it? Like, how do we keep our hearts open? How do we balance that pessimism, that seems to be growing all around us and, and might even start to poison our, us. What's your name? Raquel. 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 I th- Ibrahim has a very good answer to this. I <laughs> Trust me. Um, Raquel was struck by the... Ref- <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Raquel was struck by the Palestinian ماذا هي ما هي نصيحتك مع انك لا تحب النصائح ولكن لمن يشعر بالياس كيف نواجه الياس ونحافظ على الالم على الامل والالم امل في وجه كل هذا الرعب انا بعتقد انه اول شيء يمكن ان نفعله هو الا نكون محايدين تجاه ابسط الاشياء التي قد نراها في حياتنا اليوميه The worst thing, Raquel, is to be neutral, even in the smallest of situations. لكن إذا كنا محايدين تجاه هذه الأشياء سيتبين أننا محايدين تجاه أشياء 
أكبر. If you can be neutral in a small situation, you can be neutral in a big one. ثم أكبر وأكبر وأكبر. And then bigger and bigger, as big as genocide. هو المفارقة إنه حينما يكون هذا الحياد نحس كما لو أننا نحافظ على أنفسنا. And the paradox is that sometimes when we're neutral, we are deluded that we are self-preserving, we're protecting ourselves. لكن في الحقيقة هي أفضل وسيلة لفقدان أنفسنا. But in fact, it's the fastest, most effective way of losing ourselves, ending ourselves. لا حياة مطلقا مع الحياد. There's no life with neutrality. لأنه أي جدار وأي حجر سيقوم بهذه المهمة. A rock. A wall can be neutral. وأظن مع هذه الحياة العظيمة بكوننا بشر علينا ألا نتنازل مطلقا عن كوننا هذا المخلوق الرائع الذي وجد على هذه الأرض وعليه أن يكترث بكل شيء. As human beings with the gift of life, our responsibility is to care for everything and everyone. عبود آه عندي سؤال بسيط وعشان اخرنا شوي اول بدي اشكركم الاثنين لهي هذه المحاضره العظيمه وكثير بساطه فرحت كثير بدي اسالك آه يا دكتور نصر كيف ستغير الحياه الفوكلوريه في المجتمع الفلسطيني بعد اباده الجماعيه اللي نشهدها الان في غزه بسال هذا السؤال لان لأنك كتبت كثير وحدثت كثير عن التاريخ الفوكلوري في قناديل ملك الجليل وعن الروايات والأغاني الفوكلورية في التاريخ الفلسطيني صح. So Abud is asking Ibrahim عن about uh, the future of Palestinian folklore after this genocide. He's referring to his book The Lanterns of the King of Galilee in which uh, Ibrahim studies Palestinian folklore and incorporates it. What is the future? Of folklore and Palestinian culture. يعني إذا ما تأملنا التاريخ الفولكلور الفلسطيني وأقول حل أنا أعتبر الفولكلور يعني يتسع كثيرا ليكون كل عمل عظيم يدخل في ذاكرة الشعب يصبح جزء من هذا الفولكلور. Ibrahim likes to expand the definition of folklore to include every great work that enters into the collective memory. And if we reflect on the history of Palestinian folklore. وحينما تحدثنا عن أن شعر محمود درويش الذي كتب قبل ثلاثين وأربعين وخمسين عام هو الآن حاضر بيننا هو يمتلك قوة الفلكلور. So Mahmoud Darwish's work written 30, 40 years ago that is present, so very present in this moment, has entered into Palestinian folklore. It has the power of folklore. رواية غسان كنفاني رجال في الشمس غسان الذي تم اغتياله من ستين سنة الآن لا الآن خمسة وخمسين تقريبا who's good at math آه. <تصفيق> 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 آه. it feels like yesterday وخمسين سنة آه هي أصبحت جزء أساسي من تكوين الروح الفلسطينية another example is غسان كنفاني's men in the sun he was assassinated decades ago but it has entered into Consciousness and Palestinian identity. فكل عمل في اعتقادي ينتقل من الورق ليصبح جزءا من تكويننا النفسي بشكل أو بآخر هو يمتل يعني يمتلك قوة الموروث الشعبي. Every work of art and literature that uh, is not only on paper but uh, enters into collective memory and uh, has the power of folklore. يعني لا خوف على الفولكلور الفلسطيني يعني هناك قصائد كتبت بالتسعة وعشرين مثل من سجن عكا وطلعت جنازة هي اليوم جزء من تراثنا. Another example is a poem written in 1929 has become part of our heritage. من سجن عكا خرج الجنازة. بالضبط وهناك أشياء كتبت بالخمسينات والستينيات هي جزء من تراثنا. وهناك بعض الأغاني الوطنية الآن التي تغني تغنى مثل علي الكوفية علي الكوفية هي جزء أصيل من تراثنا 
So we are creating folklore as we speak, Yabu. So the many examples, poems written in the 50s, 60s, popular songs like Ali al Kufiya. ونرجع على المسألة ما دمت ترفض أن تموت فأنت تبتكر كل شيء قابل للحياة. As long as you refuse to die, then you continue to innovate life in ways to life. I shouldn't be asking a question, but I must. Um, what, so I'm building again on the two hours spent with the class understanding the Palestinians that uh, the conversation was completely different. <laughs> Uh, it had to do with humanism. It had to do with the many examples you gave that it's not national identity, it's not resistance. Uh, these are flattening kind of ideas. You gave a sense of poetry as very important to bring in the complexity and the contradictions of Palestinian lives in a very rich, intimate, textured way and how it, it's, it's universal. Themes. You said one of the, when somebody asked you about what do you write on, what, how does this moment, you said the field of operations of a poet or an artist is the beginning of time until the end of time. We live in this universe. So uh, I just want to bring that out and see if you have anything to say about that. Like your first book was not on Palestine, you were writing poetry for South Africa at age 22 and so on and so forth. Um, that is humanism, uh, a major feature of the writings of Mahmoud Darwish and of Edward Said and of many other Palestinians who uh, helped create a kind of a global Palestine, a global Palestinian situation by linking their condition and understanding it in a way that de-exceptionalizes their situation and sees what's in common of oppressed people everywhere. Mm. Right? And this is something you've done all along. Uh, with the moments that we've been living in over the past year and this off the scale kind of destruction and, and, and uh, tragedy, where is humanism now for you? And is there, is there anything beyond humanism that we can reach to or that can artists can draw on to um, innovate and reproduce themselves in new ways? Well, that's all right. ذكرنا بشارة بجانب من جوانب حديثنا في الصف عندما تحدثت عن أن التجربة الفلسطينية ليست استثناء وأنك معني بحركة التحرر في جنوب أفريقيا أن روايتك الأولى كانت عن تجربتك في السعودية كيف تتصدى في كل ما تكتبه لتصديح التجربة الفلسطينية وجعلها استثناء وتؤكد على أنها قضية إنسانية عالمية كونية يطلب منك بشارة أن تضيف شيئا إلى هذا وأنا أعتقد أن بشارة يتذكر جملة جميلة جدا قلتها في الصف سأقولها بالإنجليزية لا وهي أنه إذا لم, يكن إذا لم يفتح ألمك عينيك على ألم الآخرين فليس حقيقيا So I'm adding a sentence that uh, came up in our conversation If your pain does not open your heart to others pain then it's not true True pain هذا هو السؤال فكرة التجربة الفلسطينية كتجربة إنسانية مشتركة بين كل شعوب العالم وليست استثناء هي بالتأكيد واحدة من تجارب العالم القاسية يعني لسنا أول من يعيش تجربة قاسية في هذا العالم We are not the first to go first people to experience cruelty in the world ومنذ آدم وحواء هناك معانا وهناك منافي. Since the beginning of time, Adam or Eve or other beginnings, there has been cruelty and exile. ولذلك انشغل الفن في هذه والكتابة في هذه المساحة الواسعة من الألم والأمل معا. And art is always engaged in contents with the space of pain and hope at the same time. يعني كانت في زمن ما يقال ان ان المنتصرين هم الذين يكتبون التاريخ 
we used to say that the victorious are those who uh, write history. The victors write history. لكن ربما أجمل ما في التجربة الفلسطينية أن الضحايا استطاعوا أن يكتبوا التاريخ بكل هذا الفن والجمال ليكون لتكون التجربة الفلسطينية جزء من تاريخ العالم حقا. In this situation, the Palestinian situation, the victims have written history in some of the most beautiful ways, and it has, be- and their uh, versions of history have become part of the history of the world. هناك جملة في رواية أعراس غزة تقول الحكايات التي لا نكتبها تصبح ملكا لأعدائنا. The stories we do not write uh, are claimed by our enemies. So it's our responsibility to write our stories. And this is a sentence from uh, Brahim's novel, uh, Gaza Weddings. And this is not an exclusively Palestinian concern. It's a human concern. أعتقد أن النصر الأكبر لأي قوة شريرة ألا تكون هناك مدونات عما ارتكبه هذا الشر من فضائع وإبادات. Evil prevails when there are no stories told about the horrors being committed. وربما شرف الكتابة أن تقوم بهذا. And it is an honor for writing and the writers too. Play this role. وتقوم بذلك بشجاعة غير خائفة من أي شيء على الإطلاق. And writing has to happen. It has to happen with brave bravery and integrity. وربما هذا أفضل ما تحقق في التجربة الفلسطينية التي رغم هذا الألم الممتد منذ مائة عام إلا أنك لن تجد بالمطلق في أي عمل فلسطيني سطر واحد يمت إلى كراهية الآخرين. And this is probably the greatest achievement of the Palestinian experience that in over a hundred years of suffering, you will not find one sentence of hatred towards others in Palestinian literature. ورغم أننا أقول جميعا ككتاب فلسطينيين ولدنا في أسوأ الظروف الظروف القاتلة التي يعني من المعجزات أننا لم نزل على قيد الحياة وهذا الألم الذي عشنا إلا أننا ما زلنا ننظر إلى العالم بقوة الأمل ونعمل من أجل الأمل And this is amazing because most of us Palestinian artists and writers have uh, grew up in the most difficult, challenging, horrifying circumstances. It's amazing that we're still alive and still we believe in hope and work towards hope. وحتى اليوم ونحن نرى كل هذا العداء الرهيب للأنظمة العالمية في اعتقادي أنه ليست هناك أي لحظة كراهية لهذا العالم وبالعكس يعني أنا أعتبر أنه نزداد التحاما بهذا العالم And although there's a lot of resentment on the part of Palestinians towards the world regimes and governments but you will not find hatred we remain, we love life and we remain uh, we believe in the world ويعني حينما حتى بعيدا عن المسألة الوطنية يعني حينما أتذكر أو أستعيد أن هناك أكثر من مليوني شجرة تم إبادتها خلال العشرين سنة الماضية من قبل الإسرائيليين أكون ليس فقط مع فلسطين أكون مع الطبيعة وأدفع عن الطبيعة كم شجرة؟ مليونين مليونين When I think that uh, the Israeli horror has killed, murdered more than two million trees, being a Palestinian means also being with nature. شغلة يعني يعني سؤال دائما يحيرني إنه أوكي أنت تريد أن تبيد هؤلاء البشر ولكن كيف تملك الجرأة على أن تكون عدوا للأشجار? 
So the most astounding thing is that even if you set out to exterminate a people, how do you make enemies of nature and trees and water and land? لو فقط أبادوا يعني المليونين شجرة فقط هذا يكفي أن أخذ موقف ضدهم حتى لو لم أكن فلسطينية. Exterminating a million trees is enough to take a stand against this racism and horror, even if I weren't a Palestinian. نعود للحياد لا تستطيع أن تكون محايدا تجاه أي شيء اليوم يحدث في هذا العالم. We go back to the point: you cannot possibly be neutral uh, facing the horrors that we are all witnessing. فأنت فلسطيني إنسان. فلسطيني والانسان عليه ان ياخذ موقف تجاه كل ما يرتكب من جرائم في اي مكان في هذا العالم. If you're a human being, you're a Palestinian today and it's your responsibility to say no to genocide. Anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world, any moment in history. Is it working? Uh, maybe it's just working in the booth. Yeah, okay. Um, Sayyid Ibrahim, هل الشعر يتيح لك فرصا للتعبير والإبداع تختلف عن تلك التي توفرها الرواية? The question is, uh, does poetry offer the possibility for expression and creativity that, that differs in some fundamental way from the novel? شكرا يعني انا اعتقد اني محظوظ اني اكتب شعر واكتب روايه I think I'm lucky that I write both poetry and novels واحس كما لو انني في لدي حقل في شجره زيتون وشجره برتقال It's as if I own an orchard that has both a olive tree and an orange tree وربما هي يعني اعطي أو هبة. It's a gift. حينما تستطيع أن تعبر بطريقتين عن ما تعيشه. When you are capable of expressing your experiences in two different modes or ways or genres. لكن من خلال تجربتي أنا أعتقد شعري أثر في رواياتي وروايتي. أثرت في شعري. And I believe that my poetry influenced my novel, and my novel writing influenced my poetry. بالتأكيد لغة الروايات رواياتي تغيرت لكوني شاعرا. بدايات الفصول ونهايات الفصول كما لو إني أحس أنني أكتب أكتب قصيدة. I sometimes think of uh, of when writing in the novel, I think of the form or the movement of a poem. My my language in the novel is influenced by my being a poet. I think about the opening of chapters and the ending of chapters as if I'm thinking of a poem. Well, شعر يعلمك أن ترى كثير من التفاصيل. Poetry teaches you to see detail, more detail. وليس فقط الشعر يعني حينما كنت أصور وأقمت أربع معارض تصوير أحس إنه ال الكاميرا هي عيني الثالثة. And photography is another mode. Uh, I've uh, uh, held three poet, uh, photography exhibitions, exhibits, and I think the camera is my third eye. وكلما مارست فنا ما كلما أحسست أن عين أخرى تضاف إليك. And you gain another eye every time you uh, practice a different form of art. وعلاقتي بالسينما ايضا انا اعتقد انه لعبت دور كبير جدا في كتاباتي سواء الشعريه او الروائيه. And my interest in relationship and he is a cinema buff. I mean, you should have been there. Clint Eastwood was the theme last night. But my relationship and interest in cinema has also played a very important role in my writing. ومن حسن الحظ ايضا انه السرد ساهم في وجود اتجاه 
درامي او شبه ملحمي في قصائد الطويله and my use of narration inside the poem has added a dramatic dimension even epic dimension in some of my longer poems فباسم الام والابن ديوان الشعري هو سيره امي شعرا عبر 50 سنه لو لم اكن روائيا في ظني لما استطعت ان اكتبه So an example is a poetry collection titled In the Name of the Mother and the Son, which is a dramatization of Ibrahim's mother's biography. And it would have not have been possible without this collaboration between poetry and narrative in his. And this is also the same as the people of the people, the love of the people, and other examples. Many other examples. Uh, love is evil, the love of the people, and the love of the people, mirrors of angels are two other examples. In the sense that you write a literary work, and not a literary work. I come to think or I think of a poetry collections as a, as a coherent poetic work and not just a collection of individual poems, as a work with an arc and a development, a climax. And this is something that comes from my relationship with novels. novels. And I'm sometimes uh, surprised by the degree of, uh, of my use of narrative, even in very short poems. No, I can help you with four words. Thank you. One word is, who killed you? He who killed you, or yes. the one who killed you? Yes. In the evening. In the evening. He who killed you in the evening. He who killed you in the evening to occupy your place in the morning. In the morning. شاب أصبح شائبا و... became gray ولما يزل عاجزا أن ينتطي يا حبيبي حصانك but still cannot ride your horse mount your horse so he who killed you in the evening in order to occupy your place in the morning has grown gray but still cannot mount your horse <تصفيق> شكرا Oh, one more. Last uh, question. Hello. Um, I wanted to, oh, first of all, thank you both for today and for you. everything. And I wanted to ask you, we talked about what the role of poetry is in this moment and what the role of art is in this moment. But I wanted to ask you in particular what the role of translation might be in this moment, especially translation into English, which as we know is, an, is a language that has carried a lot of violence on its back in a lot of contexts. And so I wanted to ask you how you conceptualize that role of translation in this moment. What's your name? Bliss. 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 We talked about the language of the language and the language of the language. What is the language of the language? Or the language of 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 the language? كانت أداء لأداة لكثير من العنف اللغة الإنجليزية. Uh, It's a question for me. I think. <تصفيق> بس ما ما نحن we're partners شركاء. <تصفيق> That's a very important question. I mean, uh, there's resistance in translation as well. And as a translator working between Arabic and English, I'm always extremely conscious of the imbalance of power. between these two languages. Yes, as a translator into English, I want to break English. I want to invite Arabic so that it disrupts, it surprises, it uh, reclaims a space inside the grammar of English. Uh, and in many of my previous translation work, but also especially in uh, when translating Ibrahim sound, invite sound into the translated text in order to make it feel like something other than English. Not, it would be great if I were able to make it sound like Arabic, but that's impossible. Um, and uh, trans what translation can do in a hegemonic language like English is literally occupy it one text at a time. And we mentioned this in the class, uh, what's translated from Arabic into English is minuscule. 
I think our mission as translators and readers of translated literature is to seek more and more translations, even of the same work. So if these were four poems where we had seven different translations of them, I think something more impactful would happen to English. And I think that's a good thing. English can take it. And Arabic is capable of it. Uh, and the, the other amazing magical power that translation has is conversation. A translated text is necessarily more than one voice, and there's power in that, in conversation across continents, across time, across geography, and across oppression and walls of, of hatred and violence. So languages are tools, and it really depends on how we use them. Uh. يعني ببساطة حينما نقول ترجمة أنا أعتقد أنه في تبسيط للكلمة يعني ما فيش كلمة ليست هناك كلمة نستخدمها سوى كلمة ترجمة لكن لا أعتقد أنها دقيقة في هذا المجال إبراهيم is saying the word translation encompasses so much the word itself seems small and inadequate to, to you know, contain what happens in translation لكن عمليا انتقال عمل من لغة إلى لغة هو ميلاد آخر وكتابة حقيقية لهذا العمل But practically the transference of one text from a text from one language to another is a rebirth for it, a rewriting of it وفي الحالات الرائعة قد يكون ميلاده بلغة أخرى أهم من اللغة الأصلية. <تصفيق> and sometimes the translation can be more successful than the original. <تصفيق> يعني ذات مرة كان لدي ترجمة لرواية جوركي عن الفرنسية. I هذا شيء قرأته. Oh, uh. I was reading a, trans, a translation of a novel by Gorky, the mother, but translated from French into Arabic. Into Arabic. وكان حينما ظهرت الترجمة عن الروسية إلى العربية أول شيء فكرت فيه هو أن أتخلى عن الترجمة من الفرنسية إلى العربية لها عن هذه الرواية. And when a translation, a direct translation from Russian to Arabic was published, I thought of uh, um, giving up or abandoning the first indirect translation. لكن خطر بالي أن أقارن بين الترجمتين. But decided to compare. فاكتشفت أن الترجمة عن الفرنسية أجمل بكثير من الترجمة عن الروسية. Found found that the indirect one uh, translation from French is, was better from the direct translation from Russian from the original Russian. ولذلك أقول هي هي كتابة الترجمة في معناها الحقيقي هي كتابة مبدعة. Translation is creative writing. It's an act of create, creative act. ومحظوظ أي نص في العالم. يقع بين يدي مترجمة أو مترجم يكتب باللغة التي ينسطق لها النص. And a text is lucky if it uh, falls between the hands of a, of a translator who takes upon themselves to write it, to write it as if for the first time. هذا نص سعيد وليس It's a happy text. <laughs> That would be a happy text. Happy text is a good note to end on. <laughs> happy text. <laughs> Thank you very much.